Few people know the whereabouts of this corner of the Scottish Highlands, and even fewer come here, for the way is arduous and steep. When Roy Dennis comes here, he is careful to travel alone, and he always checks that no strangers follow. For Roy, who is the Highlands officer for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, is a man who guards a secret. The bird that he's concerned about here is the peregrine falcon. This is the female soaring overhead, worried at his presence. Roy hadn't known about this nest until this year. It's a typical Highland site, and from this hill overlooking the cliff, he can get a marvelous view right into the nest ledge. The peregrine is now a rare bird and specially protected by law. Roy's job is to keep an eye open for egg collectors and people who might steal young peregrines. He won't be able to relax until the young ones have flown from the nest. Roy Dennis has been watching this nest since April the 28th, when he first saw the falcon sitting on eggs. Every nest I visit, I write down what I see in my diary. May the 18th, the falcon is feeding four chicks, about 10 days old, I'd say. At this stage, they all look rather alike in size, although they will have hatched over a period of several days. Four young in the nest is an extremely encouraging thing to see. During our work, we come across many people interested in rare birds, and it's through their cooperation that so many of our birds are protected. Morning, Don. Morning, Roy. Breezy day. Yes, 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 but it's dry, you know. Aye. Easy. I was looking at the nest, Don. It seems to be an old eagle's nest. Oh, yes. She nested there about 50 years in my father's time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, way back in the 50s, the eagle took over. She nested in it once or twice. And then the ravens came in about. I don't know that they pushed the eagle out, but they took over up till about three years ago. And uh, then the peregrine returned. How many times in the past has man longed to share the falcon's power of flight, the thrill of the chase, and the final victory of the kill? The desire must go back beyond the dawn of history to the time when man was truly a hunter. Of all the birds of prey flown by man, the peregrine was the most prized. It became the prerogative of kings and princes. And in the reign of James I, a pair changed hands for a thousand pounds. Today, the art of falconry still survives due to a handful of falconers like Stephen Frank. Well, falconry is the sport of catching completely wild quarry with a trained hawk. Uh, a trained hawk, you basically control them through their appetite. Um, you obviously can't starve them because an old grouse takes a lot of catching and so you must have a very fit hawk. It's a bit like an athlete, you, you, you don't want to get too fat and you don't want to get too thin. They come back to you if they don't catch the grouse because they know you're going to give them something to eat. You take them out with the pointers. You, the dogs range at very high speed over the grass moor. And when they come up against grass, they point, they go absolutely rigid, and you know just where the grass are. Well, then you unhood the hawk, and you hold it up, and it flies away. And a, a hawk that knows about grass hawking goes up very high above the point.
In the meantime, you've been walking round so that you can flush them downwind, the dog pointing upwind. So you go right round the covey, and when the hawk's very high, you then tell the dog to go in and flush the grouse. You can see this stoop from a great height, the hawk coming down at a grouse going at 60 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, it either gets killed or it gets away absolutely free with no lead or no, no danger at all. The whole thing about grouse hawking is the pleasure you get from seeing the stoop, the, the wonderful flying of the peregrine that I think most people think is one of the most wonderful flyers in the world. This is really what falconry is all about, admiring the flight, this fantastic flight of the peregrine. And I think gamekeepers and naturalists and most people would always talk about a stoop if they ever saw a stoop in the wild. They remember it. But by training hawks to go for grouse, you can manufacture, as it were, this stoop every day. And you, you can marvel at it every day to see the wonderful flight of the peregrine and this stoop from a great height. May the 24th, the young ones are growing rapidly, and it's no wonder when you see how fast the falcon is feeding them. Watch how she piles the food into them. All of them, even the smallest one, gets a good share in the end, which is just as well, as this is the period of maximum development, when bones and feathers are growing rapidly. The young need three or four fair-sized birds each day to feed on. So the male bird, called the tiersel, as he's a third the size of the falcon, is rarely seen. He's away hunting all day. What makes the peregrine falcon the most successful flying bird? Every detail of its makeup has been designed to this end. Its feathers are an insulation so efficient that the peregrine probably never feels the cold. Its talons are instruments of death rather than locomotion. When it preens, it does so with the same caution as a man scratching himself with a sharp dagger. For the peregrine, flight is effortless. Just watch these slow motion shots. Possessed of superb streamlining and a buoyancy that it has to resist to stay earthbound, equipped with enormous pectoral muscles, the peregrine can reach speeds of over 200 miles per hour in a vertical stoop. The peregrine is master of the air. To us, the air is something we breathe or a wind that gets in our way. To the peregrine, the sky is a network of currents, rivers of air flowing, eddying, rising, falling, highways to follow and ride. To be a superb flyer is not enough. The peregrine needs sharp eyesight. Ranging over the skies, seeking out prey, the peregrine's eyesight is more than just sharp. It's almost beyond our comprehension. It's more than eight times as keen as man's.
how then could a bird so superbly equipped to survive be brought to the verge of extinction? Because it has one enemy, man. The glorious 12th, grouse shooting. The perfection of the breech-loading shotgun during the early 1800s brought with it the concept of raising huge heads of game on vast areas of land for the entertainment of shooting parties. Any natural predators which presumed to take what man considered his rightful property were ruthlessly destroyed. <laughs> the peregrine had other enemies during the 1800s, apart from gamekeepers. Many Victorians and Edwardians, like the Reverend F.C.R. Jourdain, were keen egg collectors. In his diary for April the 22nd, 1899, he wrote, On descending to the ledge, I saw, further away, this year's nest hole, containing three splendid eggs. With his monogram on them are the three splendid eggs mentioned in the diary. A good collection in those days not only contained single eggs of each species, but whole clutches. Taxidermy flourished. The sighting of a rare bird couldn't be verified unless the blood-stained corpse could be produced to prove it. Yet out of this pseudo-scientific slaughter, there came a growing awareness of the living bird as something more beautiful and fascinating than any collection of dead specimens. An awareness that is brilliantly captured by Joseph Wolfe's lithograph of a peregrine falcon. Then came the photographers, those early photographers must have been men with nerves of iron and muscles of steel. Somehow they got their cumbersome equipment to the ledges near the nest site. Today the law is absolute. Not only are the birds especially protected, but it's illegal to disturb them at the nest site, and a license must be obtained for photography. The young are now four weeks old. They're very much stronger, so much so that one of them grabs a leg and goes to join another which is feeding itself. The other two are still being fed by the female. The nest ledge is becoming very untidy with the littered remains of bones and feathers from the prey. And amongst them, we can identify the remains of golden plover, red grouse, common gull, starling, a wide variety of birds that live in the glen. You can see the difference in age now, some birds coming on faster than others. Pull up after a good feed, doze in together in a warm huddle of contentment, eyes sealing over, brown feathers poking through the down, 
and the broad pale tips of the tail feathers very prominent. Everything looks good at the nest site and that's off back home for me. As Roy Dennis walks back, he passes through the territories of many other birds and beasts that make up the peregrine's world. There'll be some that are neighbors, like this buzzard. And as he drops down into the valley, there are others like the oyster catcher, that are food for the peregrine and its young. This area is particularly rich in wildlife. At least there will be plenty of food for the young peregrines when they start to hunt for themselves. Soon the skies will be full of inexperienced young birds who haven't learnt the meaning of danger, and only the fittest and wisest will survive. And this, of course, is how it should be. The summer days are very long and are really the time for field work in the highlands. But now Roy Dennis goes back to his office for the important job of writing up the records from notes he's made of the various nests he's visited during the day. From up-to-date records, we can see trends developing and also see gaps in our knowledge. For instance, we need to know how many nests are successful, more about how many young peregrines survive their first winter, how far do they migrate, and so on. No, if you go down to that corner over there, Malcolm. On this occasion, I'm going down the cliff to ring the four young peregrines in their nest. The young birds are not all that happy about my arrival, nor is the falcon, which circles anxiously overhead. My job is to ring them in double quick time and get them settled back into the nest as quickly as possible.
The special ring has a number and address on it. Anyone sending in the ring off a dead peregrine may therefore be increasing our knowledge of peregrine populations and helping us with our work of conservation. much on that at all. After ringing, we watch to see that the falcon comes back to feed her young. At five weeks, the young are pretty big and the oldest one will soon be flying. They're getting rid of their down, scratching away all the time, pulling and worrying at their plumage until they've got their feathers into really good shape for flying. They might also be looking for parasites, fleas and flat flies, which have come off the prey brought into the nest. Today, looking into the nest, one can see that it's not been a very good day for homing pigeons. There's probably been a race from Thurzo over the highlands and the Tearsaw has caught some of the stragglers on the way south. During the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II, the Peregrine was declared an ally of the Axis powers. Dick Trelevan, an authority on the peregrines in Cornwall, tells us why. During the war, the air ministry decided that all peregrine falcons should be uh, exterminated because air crews at that time were carrying pigeons as a reserve against their wireless sets. Should they uh, crash in the sea or crash in France, they had these pigeons on board, and if their wirelesses failed, then they could release a pigeon, which presumably would home to this country all right. But with the large number of peregrine falcons that Cornwall contained, uh, they felt that the peregrines might well kill the odd pigeon and the vital messages and clues might well be lost. In fact, there was an air ministry order called Peregrine Falcons, the destruction of Peregrine Falcons order, 1940, dated July the 1st, 1940, made by the Secretary of State, one. In any of the areas specified in this schedule, here too, it shall be lawful for any person authorized by me or on my behalf to take or destroy at any time Peregrine Falcons or the eggs of peregrine falcons. This area, of course, uh, included the Cornish coast. Now, this paper was an open charter to all the egg collectors in the area to go around and rob every hourly. In fact, egg collectors knew more about the locations of the peregrines in Cornwall than did any of the ornithologists. Old records show that it was the British Museum of Natural History who contacted experienced naturalists and bird-washing societies throughout the country and asked them to assist the air ministry teams and gamekeepers in the destruction of peregrines. The carcasses were sent to the museum and between 1940 and 1945 over 600 peregrines were killed and countless eggs destroyed. We were all worried that at the end of the war, the peregrine might be lost to Cornwall. But it was a great sense of relief, really, that as soon as the war was over, peregrines came back. And not did they just come back, they returned to the identical ledgers that they had bred in 1939. This happened all along the coast. I suppose in Cornwall, there was something like 20 peregrine iris that were occupied each year. And five years after the war was over, 
I think I'm right saying 17 of those iris were reoccupied and actually uh, producing young. <laughs> The pigeon is undoubtedly the peregrine's favourite prey. Some falcons feed on little else. And when pigeon fanciers noticed that homers failed to return from a race, war was once again declared on the peregrine, as Colin Osman, editor of the Racing Pigeon magazine, explains. Pigeon fanciers don't like this. They don't like their failed favourites to be killed and the racing spoiled. So when this happened to in a particular case in South Wales, they tried to get permission to take one pair of peregrines to stop this particular problem, and they thought that it would be possible to do it in the same way as falconers were at that time allowed to take a pair for training. When the application was made to the Home Office, it unfortunately wasn't quite that simple, and the Home Office wanted an inquiry under the peregrine numbers. I was the organizer Dr. Derek Ratcliffe was in charge of the inquiry. The results at the end of 1962 showed that far from there being a marked increase in numbers, as had been alleged, there was a very sharp and unprecedented decline in numbers. We continued to look at the population and in 1963 found that the decline had leveled off but with numbers remaining at only 44% of the pre-1939 level, which was estimated at about 700 pairs, a fairly stable population. The decline had been worst in the south of the country, with very few pairs remaining in, in the south of England or Wales, where there used to be good numbers. The bulk of the population that was left was in the Scottish Highlands, but only in the centre and east of the Highlands, in inland areas, was the situation more or less normal. It was the revolution in farming methods after the Second World War that led to the decline of birds of prey, especially the peregrine. New solutions were found to old problems. Suddenly, from being places of sanctuary and peace for the creatures of the wild, the innocent fields of Britain became impregnated with menace and danger as the manufacturing chemists opened a latter-day Pandora's box of pesticides. Pigeons fed on seed dressed with pesticides and peregrines ate the pigeons with fatal results. A sinister side effect was the presence of cracked eggs at the few sites where surviving birds tried to breed. By measuring egg shells from these sites, Dr. Ratcliffe found them 18% thinner than pre-pesticide eggs. The pesticide was inhibiting the flow of calcium that produces normal eggs. Twelfth of June and the young birds are ranging quite widely on the nest ledge, flapping like mad at times and getting quite adventurous. This one could fly at any time. It'll be a big step from the safety of the nest out into the outside world. At this stage, apart from wing flapping exercises, a peregrine's life at the nest site is rather monotonous. They sit for ages, hoping the falcon will come back with food. But they are learning. They are surveying their surroundings and learning the geography of the glen. We always think of peregrines as ferocious birds, but just look how gently and delicately they are nibbling away at each other's beaks.
At the far end of the glen, a tractor is ploughing, ready for planting trees. This is one of the problems in protecting rare birds in the highlands. Pressures on land and wildlife are increasing all the time, and liaison with landowners and managers is very important. In this case, there's a particularly good relationship, and the ploughing has been delayed until the birds are ready to fly. Contacts have to be kept with all sorts of people, including the police, who help deal with anyone breaking the Protection of Birds Act. Egg collectors still come to the highlands. There are still a number of people who illegally take young peregrines from the nest. There are estates which still destroy them. And it's the job of men like Roy Dennis to change their attitudes to these fine birds. I don't think he's up to any good, and we're worried. Well, if we took a, a note of the number, yeah, uh, yeah. we'd keep an eye out for them anyway. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. How are the birds? Oh, fine. They're doing quite well, actually. There's four young there. Four? Yeah. The future of the peregrine lies in establishing a really good network of volunteer wardens. Bird watchers, keepers, anyone interested in the birds on their land who can keep tabs on every known nest, especially those that are close to roads, which are the more likely to be robbed. Are the old birds up there today? Yes, uh, they've been knocking about earlier, but they've drifted just the other side of the cliff. In the face of such vigilance, is there any need now to fear for the future of the peregrine? The former director of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, Peter Conder. The problem with the peregrine is that it's a, a very glamorous bird. It's one of the most glamorous birds of the lot. It's jolly good to look at. It's got wonderful action in the air. It's one of the fastest birds. And for those who like the sport of killing, it's a killer. And this, unfortunately, has attracted certain undesirable elements in human beings. So many people, instead of uh, liking to uh, admire the thing in the wild, want to grasp it in their own hands, want to hold it. And this is not where nature should be. One of the big problems, of course, that uh, affected the peregrine way back in the 1950s, 60s, around about that time, was the use of organoclined pesticides. Well, since then, the bird's been improving generally until in 1975, we reckon that the peregrine population is about 60% of normal, something like 420 occupied territories, something like that. But in the rest of the world, and certainly in the rest of Europe, numbers are still extremely low. And we have therefore got in this country a very important segment of the peregrine population. 22nd of June. Two of the falcon's young have already flown. The two that she's feeding ought really to be flying too, but they're still hanging on, taking a lot of food off this particular prey, which is a grouse. And now once the falcon's left, they're feeding themselves properly. The second to last youngster is going through a really good wing flapping exercise. He should fly at any moment. And there's his first go. Not much of a flight, but at least it's a start. Now he's away properly to join his brothers and sisters round the corner of the cliff. These first flights are very hesitant, rather flappy, unsteady and round winged compared to the adults. They're not so good at landing either. Here they are flopping about on a grassy slope below the nest ledge.
Is there anything that can be done apart from protecting the population of wild peregrine falcons? At Cornell University's Laboratory of Ornithology in the United States, the answer may have been found by Professor Tom Cade. Our falcon studies at Cornell have two main goals. One is to learn how to breed peregrines in captivity in sufficient numbers so that we can maintain a stock for research and conservation. In the past few years, we've made considerable strides toward reaching that goal. The domestic husbandry of the peregrine is now an accomplished fact, and we can move on to learn how to accomplish our second goal, which is to reintroduce into the wild captive produced peregrines in regions of North America where the species no longer breeds. Few people realize how small a number of peregrines there are left in the wild in North America. For example, in the east, east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, where there used to be 400, uh, r roughly 300 to 400 pairs of peregrines breeding uh, in southern Canada and the United States, there are now no known breeding pairs of peregrines left. In our far west, where there probably were 400 to 500 pairs breeding in the old days, there are now estimated to be 50 to 75 pairs remaining, but many of those are not reproducing successfully. Even in the uh, f far north, uh, uh, there have been uh, reductions of 50% or more in local breeding populations since the late 1960s, and only in the Pacific Northwest coastal regions of British Columbia and in the Aleutian Islands are peregrines uh, uh, at their original numbers in North America. Our uh, hawk barn is divided up into 36 breeding chambers. A corridor running along the upper story of the building enables technical associate Jim Weaver to keep an eye on any one of the 36 breeding chambers. One-way glass means that the birds can be watched without being disturbed. The breeding stock are mostly falconers' birds donated to the project. Each breeding chamber has a variety of perches and nesting ledges. One of the problems that we have to be constantly on the lookout for in our breeding lofts is incompatibility between mates. We really need to know what sort of behavior is taking place in these rooms at any particular time. And one of the ways we have um, gone about doing this is to have an audio monitoring system so that we can record the sound in any of these rooms at a particular time. And uh, these particular calls that you're hearing are courtship uh, vocalizations, which means that everything is going along fine. And about um, two weeks after we hear these sounds, we can expect mating to occur. And then about another two weeks after that, we can expect the first eggs to be laid if everything is going well. A week after the last egg is laid, we remove the whole clutch and place them in an incubator. The eggs are turned six times a day to prevent the embryo from sticking to the shell. The newly hatched chick is swabbed down and an antibiotic applied to prevent infection at the spot where it was attached to its yolk sac. The chick is then weighed before being placed in a brooder. The young are hand-fed on finely minced up fresh meat. Jim Weaver imitates the falcon's call to promote the chick's beak-gaping reflex. At first they are fed by forceps, but as they grow older and stronger, they are soon able to help themselves to food. They are hand reared to two and a half to three weeks old before being introduced to their parents. The parents accept them readily and the young quickly take to the new way of being fed. In 1974, three mature pairs of peregrines produced 21 young. Two others, which had previously only produced infertile eggs, raised one young apiece. So our total for the year was 23 new peregrines. This year we are doing even better. Now that we're uh, successful at uh, producing peregrines in captivity, we can only keep a small number of the, of the young for breeding stock, and most of the birds will be going out into the field in attempts to learn how to reintroduce peregrines into the wild. 
For one of our initial sites, we've chosen a local place called Taganic Falls, which is about five miles from the Cornell campus. This is a beautiful uh, landmark, and it's also a, f a famous old Falcon Eyrie, where peregrines nested every year until about 1946. The historic uh, films that you're viewing were taken in 1941 of the then active site, it's under the roots of some, some trees. Well, that uh, site has eroded away long since, but we feel strongly that the peregrines um, belong back at Taganic. One of the reasons is because research in Great Britain has shown that these old historic sites, which used to be occupied before the decline there, are the very same places that are now being reoccupied by new birds. For our uh, initial release at Taganic, we've chosen a new site on the north wall of the rim where we can provide safe protection for the youngsters while they're growing up and also where we have ready access to taking care of them until they are independent. The four-week-old peregrines are placed in an artificial nest site. The idea of placing the young out at that age is the expectation that they will become imprinted on the site or area and return to it at breeding age. A 24-hour guard is mounted on the site to prevent human disturbance and also to ward off natural predators. The birds are fed by means of a chute so that they won't become conditioned to humans as providers of food. At five to six weeks, the birds are making short flights to adjoining ledges and are becoming aware of Taganic Gorge as their natural home. It's important to know how the birds disperse when they start to fly and the extent to which they migrate. Transmitters fitted to the birds' legs enable their progress to be monitored by radio telemetry. Since 1974, Tom Cade's team at Cornell has restored 150 peregrines back to the wild. In 1978 alone, 53 young peregrines were released at 11 different sites in North America. A new era, an era in which falconers, aviculturists, conservationists and nature lovers can join hands to preserve and manage birds of prey for human enjoyment and enlightenment. It's the end of June, high summer with just a little snow left on the tops. And back in Scotland, all four young have left the nest. The falcon will be glad to see them all on the wing at last. They'll hang around the glen for another couple of months, but then they'll disperse. And I'm delighted also to see them all flying so well in the air. The danger's over, and I can relax at last.
The young are fed by the falcon on the wing at this stage. One of them comes up and grabs the prey, a carrion crow. A carrion crow is a pretty hefty load for a young peregrine and it glides down to what can only be called a crash landing in the heather. They start chasing other birds like this gull, but at this stage they aren't very successful. Each day the young peregrine's flying ability improves. Their speed is really increasing and some of their stoops are breathless.